Well, here we are in Lawn, Texas, which is just south of Abilene. And we are actually going to an Atlas missile silo base. It's an Atlas F model. It's a Lawn Atlas missile base. They call it LAM. And this is the entrance to it. Looks like they got a marker up here. Ooh, look at all those grasshoppers. Holy smokers. Looks like the ground's moving. Let's see. That's a lot of reading, so you guys can pause it if you want to read it. We're gonna head on down here. I found out about this place. I was, believe it or not, I was watching YouTube, and this guy named I think his name is uh, Larry Sanders, and he was talking about this. He bought this uh, a while back, and he's been restoring it. And I sent him an email and said, "Hey, I'm really interested." And he says, "Well, when can you come down?" So here we are, out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> By Lawn, Texas. Gonna go inside of a old abandoned Atlas F ICBM missile site. Well, let's head up the road. A few moments later. Yeah, here we are. This looks like the entrance. Got a couple of people, old guys over here. So let's go walk over there. See what's going on. Just looking around out here. Oof. Still out in the middle of nowhere. All right. Let's go see how this works. Um, this is by design, and we started down this road years ago, was for the preservation of the heritage of the Atlas ICBM. And my motivation for doing this was when I was working for the Texas Senate. I learned that there was not a single Atlas ICBM site in America that was preserved under any agenda for the future. And we have our Titan Museum outside of uh, um, Green Valley, Arizona. We have uh, the Minuteman Museum in South Dakota, but nothing for the Atlas ICBM. And that shocked me and kind of infuriated me. So if, if America is not going to do this under a, a federal grant or initiative, uh, Texans just have to recognize this part of it, their Cold War heritage and do something to save at least one of these sites. And that was my motivation for moving forward. So uh, this is a rough site, but uh, you know the agenda is preservation, even if it's contextual. So we're, we don't have any capability of restoring this to a operational standard like the Green Valley site for the Titan Museum. That is a fully operational site. And even with a Titan ICBM in the silo, that is a trainer that came from Shepard Air Force Base. So you can sit down in that launch control center and a uh, tour guide there will run you through the entire launch sequence. We did. We turned the key. Yeah. We turned the key. It's magic. <laughs> it, it really is magic. And they've used that for multiple productions. Um, one of the most realistic documentaries on the um, Arkansas event uh, that was at, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the site. Um, think of it here in a second, but the uh, the ICBM that blew up in oh, the yeah. silo there yeah, yeah. and uh, created a, a national furor because uh, they had actually lost the uh, the weapon for several hours before they located it. But um, that was a absolutely amazing documentary they produced via um, digital Im imagery, actual footage from uh, archives, and then at the Titan Museum, uh, recreating that event. It's just a splendid um, recollection of that uh, very frightening uh, loss of that site. Um, anyway, um, 
so I presented this uh, idea to uh, my family and uh, you know my wife bought into it and uh, that's what we've been working on now continuously since 1990. Uh, obviously underfunded because uh, it's all out of pocket money. Um, we've uh, pursued opportunities but there's a lot of competition these days for uh, historic preservation and uh, you know we have our foot in the door but we're really not there yet in terms of uh, creating a 40 by 100 foot Quonset hangar visitors center on the property, having um, year-round manned uh, have personnel here to offer uh, guidance and uh, interpretation of the site, and this will be our little slice of historic preservation for Atlas Heritage. And uh, we're excited about where we are, but we have a long way to go. So. Um, I started this again in 1990, and um, we've had really exciting benchmark events. Uh, the creation of the Atlas ICBM Highway. It's the first time in America that uh, a highway has been named after a Cold War mission. And uh, I wrote that legislation, and that's the first bill that our new um, Governor Bush signed during his tenure here as governor before he went on to the presidency. And then uh, we also have uh, regular historic events here where we bring in veterans and celebrate their engagement in this Cold War history. Um, it's just been very, very exciting to share this history. And uh, quite a few documentaries produced on it already, and that will continue over the years. Let's do a quick surface tour before we go down to the Launch Control Center. Do watch your step. Um, there's a prolific rattlesnake population on the on the property. Nice. Uh, I'm at 156 now. No kidding. My son is at 125. Holy shit. Not like we're counting, <laughs> but we are in competition. Um, and that's just on this small property. Holy cow. <laughs> you never know when you're going to find them. So that's why you got to keep your eyes open all the time. Now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over the last year, we've seen a lot fewer snakes, and that's because I think we have a uh, a good population of uh, competitive snakes. We have uh, the co coach whips, the uh, silver racers, or whatever you want to call them, which are uh, adversarial to rattlesnakes, and I think they've done a good job in balancing the population here. So does a shotgun. can get on the uh, the east side that way you're not looking into the sun right <laughs> especially for our video producer uh, I like to start my tours right here because it gives you a contextual impression of the scale of these properties now, right now you're standing on the roof of the second tallest building in Taylor County Abilene's tallest skyscraper is 20 stories and uh, the silos are 18 and a half stories, but they just happen to be buried. And you really get, you have to look at a skyscraper to understand the scale of these sites. Uh, they're designed to withstand all but the effect of a direct hit from a thermonuclear weapon. And of course they were built at, at a time when the Soviet Union did not have the ability in terms of navigation accuracy or number of warheads to threaten 72 of these sites nationwide. So that's what made this such an effective deterrent weapon because the Soviets had no way to deal with it. And they knew that if they attacked us, these sites would survive and when the time was right, the door, the 70 ton doors would open the Atlas ICBM would ascend on its massive elevator system, would stand approximately 25 feet above where we're standing right now, and the missile itself was uh, 85 feet tall with a uh, the thermonuclear weapon on its nose and had the ability to reach any strategic target in the Soviet Union in approximately 30 minutes. Now this guy, this is Atlas F, they lifted him up, then did they fuel him or, or could he be fueled down there? It was simultaneous. They okay. started that fueling process 
and the, they could keep the kerosene propellant on board all the time, okay. but it had to be topped off, so to speak, with the liquid oxygen as it was ascending, okay. and then would be completely fueled by the time by the time it came to the surface. Okay, and uh, they weren't designed to be instantaneously launchable like the Titans and the solid propellant Minuteman, but. 12 to 15 minutes was approximate time for preparation before it launched. And uh, it had the ability, because of its inertial navigation system, to fly over 8,500 miles and land within 1,500 yards of its target. Now, 1,500 yards is not accurate by today's navigational standards, but considering the W-38 weapon that was carried this rocket would leave approximately a 30 mile footprint. 1,500 yards is accurate enough. Yeah. And the Soviet Union knew that. So it was a very, very intimidating deterrent weapon. It was very, very effective because obviously we never had to launch it in the context of an offensive move. And what, what year are we talking about? Larry? The missile was first launched in late 1958. Uh, the final version was ready to go just in early 1960 and was fully operational by the end of 1960. So it, it was very, very fast because it was our first ICBM and we had to have that because administratively at that time there was a perception in America that we were behind the Soviet Union and that's what they call politically the missile gap. And uh, President Kennedy used that to his strategic advantage because it made the Republicans look like uh, Eisenhower had allowed the Soviets to get ahead of America. And um, that probably cost Nixon that first contest, among other reasons. Now, I did mention the inertial navigation system. And engineering-wise, that's the most interesting aspect of this entire site, in my opinion. Mm. And that, well, first of all, let me mention that the surface that we're standing on this was the surface of the entire site when it was operational. So the missile would come down the main entry road, could drive right across the silo cap going north to align itself and then would back up and they would lock the transporter down to the concrete pads you see articulated here to our north. And then uh, the doors would be open, the uh, launch platform position accurately and then they would erect the missile, lock it onto the launcher and then nest the bird and that was the process for delivering an ICBM to the site and you really have to use your imagination to try to think about everything within a four acre square here being exactly at the level we're standing on right now and that's part of my jealous attitude about the sites in Roswell because <laughs> They still have the characteristic, yeah. perfect, you know, nothing's changed on those sites. And uh, obviously it's not the case with the, the West Texas sites. Now when I call attention to the single, kind of a T-shaped concrete piece out there all by itself, which is the end of a very special device um, system on this um, launch complex called the site tube. And there's a metal plate that if you remove that metal plate, it would expose a 10 inch steel pipe. And that 10 inch steel pipe was 180 feet long and went into the ground to level six of the silo at such a precise angle and precise positioning at that 49 degrees would allow a device at the end of that 180 foot 10 inch pipe called the collimator to look through that pipe at Polaris program the missile's inertial navigation system, telling it exactly where in space it was, and allowing it then to be sent to exactly where the drop point was going to be for that weapon. And that's what made it so intimidating was the incredible accuracy of that system. I tend to think about the incredible accuracy of just putting a 180 foot 10 inch pipe in the ground and allowing it to be positioned so perfectly 
that at the base of that you could look through that pipe. You know, that 10 inch pipe's big, but if you look through that, 180 feet away, there'd be a speck, mm -hmm. and that speck would be Polaris. That's insanely accurate. And uh, we're talking about, you know, the guys in the white shirts and black ties with the pocket protectors and the slide rules. You know, pre-computers, this is all that generation of, of technology. And uh, they did this over and over and over again at every missile launch site. And uh, that's remarkable engineering to me. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we go below ground. Uh, here on the north side we have the water purification building and we're going to plan a total restoration of that structure. Uh, we have the emergency escape hatch over here to the west of the entry portal. The back of the property is a telescoping antenna pit which is the backup high frequency antenna for communication. And we also have the low frequency antenna that uh, used literally the Earth's magnetic field for communications and they could actually communicate with submarines using the low frequency communication system. And then we had two pads over here to the south uh, for the 40 100 foot Quonset hangars that used to exist here. And that's basically the surface details. Any questions? Let's go to, let's get in the hole. Okay. Watch out for snakes. <laughs> I said watch out for snakes. Oh yeah. It's when they salvaged the crib. So all the steel that was here was purchased and salvaged. And when they had made everything, they took bulldozers and just pushed those 70 ton doors closed. So if you ever had your mother yell at you for slamming the doors, that would have been insane to listen to two 70-ton doors just fall without any resistance. And that's why the concrete's fractured and the frame running across the center line there is bent up. Because you can imagine what a force, a velocity that was unrestrained. And uh, it just... Do you know how long it would take to actually open them when it was operational? Um, about 15, 16 seconds. Oh, really? Yeah. Not that quick. Yeah. And I'll explain that uh, on the way down. Uh, they utilized what's referred to as a hydraulic accumulator. And a hydraulic accumulator is a series of eight cylinders with a divisory structure in the center there, so they would continuously put pressure on the hydraulic fluid, and the other half of the cylinder was filled with nitrogen gas. And of course you can't compress a liquid, but you can compress that gas, and incrementally that nitrogen gas would be compressed to the point all of that energy was stored, so that when they wanted to open the doors, they would just release that energy, and that's what allowed those doors to open so quickly. Come on in. Smells like an old basement. Oh, man. Well, usually, it's, it's not like this 90% of the time. And that's due entirely to the humidity that we've got that we're accumulating down there right now. So when the crew of five would arrive here for their 24-hour shift, they had all their provisions for that shift. And the commander would approach you know, the telephone, give the code word of the day, the store would be unlocked remotely by the commander on site, then the team would walk into what was referred to, because there was an identical locked door here and the store would be locked behind them, but this was the entrapment area. Commander would give the code word again, and then the commander on site would respond with a number to which the arriving commander 
had to add a number to equal the number of the day that only the two commanders were aware of. So if they were arriving under duress, all the arriving commander had to do was give the wrong number and that would be the automatic signal to call the four security guys that were on the site 24-7 and deal with the threat. And uh, if everything added up properly and everything was A-OK, -okay, this door would be remotely unlocked and then the crew would walk into the vestibule and encounter the first of two one-ton manganese steel blast doors. And I believe manganese is always mentioned, but uh, it's just because it has a higher melting temperature. But the key to this entire entry area is the almost maze-like approach. The blast. And that's here, well, there's four right-angle turns. Yeah. And those right angle turns are here as a result of the engineers because every time there's a right angle turn, there's a dramatic reduction in the overpressures that can be exerted on our blast doors. And so there's three right angle turns, the first door, and then there's a fourth right angle turn before we get to the second door. And that guarantees the integrity of these blast doors and protecting the, the, the crew in the launch control center. The right angle turns also guarantee that the crew can never be exposed to radiation because radiation can only move in straight lines. So there's a secondary benefit of the four right angle turns as we enter the launch control center. century addition to the Texas Forts Trail, mm -hmm. which is a series of 10 frontier forts in uh, West Texas. And I think uh, that would demonstrate the continuity of Texas military heritage, connecting our frontier military sites to our uh, 20th century tw uh, military sites as well. You know, I ask almost facetiously, does anyone remember the Cold War? No. <laughs> yeah, I think we all fit in that well, one. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, demographically, we're, we're right there where we need to be. But, uh, you know, I ask that question because, you know, no one talks about the Cold War. Um, we just don't encounter discussions in almost any context about the Cold War and its significance. And, uh, you know, from 45 to 91, now this is really a, a complex series of questions. It was among the longest military conflicts in America's history. What was the longest military conflict in America's history? The next to the longest one was Afghanistan, but that's still number two. The longest was the war between the United States and the Comanche Nation. That's the longest military conflict in America's history. And no one talks about that either. <laughs> it's just pretty amazing. But it influenced every as aspect of, uh, of America, politically, militarily, um, 
growing up in that era, and, you know, we couldn't even walk down the street of a major city without encountering some aspect of that, that conflict. Uh, so whether we were in the military or not, we lived it. We fought it as civilians or military members. And if you don't believe me, just think about the Olympics during that time frame. Uh, think about America's hockey victory against the Soviet Union. I mean, that was like the biggest thing that happened that entire decade. Uh, so we all fought it in one way or another. A very, very competitive time frame. The entire space race. Well, what made that a race was America versus the Soviet Union. And we won that. So we all fought it. I grew up, and I'm sure you all experienced duck and cover. Uh, especially me growing up in the suburbs of Manhattan, New York, we all thought we were ground zero, so I grew up uh, with this ridiculous and futile attempt to uh, keep us safe. But mom and dad felt good about that. We survived it, obviously, or we wouldn't be here talking about it. But one thing we never hear, ever hear, is the fact that we won it! Unequivocally, we won the Cold War, and America is so embarrassed about that, and I don't understand why you don't hear in any context Americans bragging about the fact that we won emphatically the Cold War. Well, because of that, unfortunately, because we don't celebrate that and recognize that, we have fallen into a situation where we forgot it. And what I feel is really unfortunate is we forgot the people who were a part of that victory. And that's really a sad thing because there are tremendous sacrifices during the Cold War, uh, tremendous losses of life. You know, people ignorantly refer to the Cold War on a regular basis as a bloodless war. Come on. I mean, they have no clue what they're talking about. It was a very significant conflict with great human sacrifice, both militarily and civilian-wise. Um, my concern is if we don't talk about that and remember, especially Texas' role in the Cold War, we're going to forget it. So the thesis for my engagement here in celebrating Cold War history is honor Cold War veterans and survivors, recognize Texas' decisive role, second only to California, in terms of uh, contractor, civilian, military training, deployments, etc. Identify and preserve Cold War historic assets, which are disappearing at a frighteningly fast rate, and then properly interpret those sites for education and heritage tourism. So that's our agenda here at the Lawn Atlas Missile Base. And time is our biggest enemy because especially in the context of Cold War era sites, rust never sleeps. So uh, our Cold War assets are disappearing very rapidly. The Atlas ICBM is just a great example of a Cold War era weapon that was incredibly visible, highly funded, no expenses were spared in its creation, and highly successful, yet it's rapidly forgotten. And um, it, it really is a great symbol of um, where we were in the Cold War. It was President Eisenhower's number one national defense priority, just like our number one defense priority today is the war on terrorism. And um, incrementally, it's becoming more and more the, the war that uh, Russia is engaged in, but we'll see what happens there. First flown in uh, 19, late 1958 as a prototype, and those are the two booster engines, and then the fully deployed missile in 1959, and it was ready to go into action with the Strategic Air Command the following year. And that's a implementation that's unprecedented in the history of military weapons, to have a totally revolutionary system developed and employed militarily in such a short period of time. It changed every aspect of our aerospace industry. And I love this picture. 
because it demonstrates the revolutionary nature of the Atlas ICBM's design. And I know this looks like uh, you know, your Reynolds wrap out of your kitchen, and that's the closest thing I can describe to what you're looking at here. This is stainless steel foil. And it's cut into precise lengths, put onto jigs, and Convair had developed a technology to weld seamlessly stainless steel foil into a continuous balloon of stainless steel that was inflated by nitrogen gas after assembly. So, <clears throat> to the untrained eye, this looks like a big beer can. <laughs> but it's the perfect model for the Atmos ICBM because you can demonstrate all the physics with a sealed Coke can, beer can, whatever. Uh, as long as the can is sealed, that's the key. You can put that on the floor and stand on it. Doesn't matter how big you are. You can stand on it. Now you put it on the side, you'll probably compromise it. But vertically, you can stand on a sealed can. That's the entire concept of the Atlas ICBM. Because this sealed envelope of stainless steel, as long as it has a gas or fuel or contents, it's extremely high in its ability to absorb stress, uh, carry weight. It's, it's remarkable. And it's totally revolutionary in that design idea. Now you look at that and you think that, oh, it's just like a regular airframe. On the contrary, there's nothing inside of that. It's on the assembly line here, there's a partition. So when it's in operation, the lower third is filled with kerosene, which is the propellant, RP, RP1. The upper two thirds is filled with liquid oxygen. And as long as you have contents inside that missile, it has tremendous rigidity. And that's what gives the missile its integrity. The entire mass of the missile itself is contained in the engine compartment. So these components here at the base of the missile are basically the only payload that has to be built. And that's why we refer to the Atlas ICBM as a balloon rocket, because it's inflated, just like a hot air balloon. And if it's unfueled and it's just inflated by the nitrogen gas, as it would be normally in a silo deployment, uh, if it ever had a leak, it would just shrink like a hot air balloon. And um, most people have no idea of that unique design characteristic of the Atlas ICBM. And that's why you see very, very few atlases on static display at uh, museums or anywhere, unless they've paid a lot of money to go inside there and create a a conventional airframe inside the aluminum skin, which would be very costly. Another innovation that came about as a result of the Atlas ICBM is what you see the crewmen doing here, and they hated doing this. On a regular basis, they had to wipe down the entire missile with a revolutionary product designed to prevent oxidation of the stainless steel skin. And you say, well, it's stainless steel. Well, yes, but stainless steel can still oxidize, and the skin is so thin that any rusting or oxidation of that skin could compromise its integrity. And that product is sitting on the shelf right there, WD-40, <laughs> and WD-40 was designed specifically for the Atlas ICBM. And it's still manufactured in the birthplace of the Atlas, San Diego, California. And uh, sometimes they have the classic WD-40 cans and you can look at the back and it'll have the Atlas story on the WD-40 cans. So I thought you all would enjoy that. <laughs> first launched, uh, uh, well the first telecommunications satellite was launched on an off the shelf Atlas D. ICBM 
from Cape Canaveral. And uh, President Eisenhower made his first national broadcast uh, on this particular communication satellite. And it changed the world in that regard. It uh, started our race to the moon. And you notice only five of the Mercury flights utilized atlases because the first two were uh, non-orbital. They were just testing the uh, re-entry vehicle. So they were launched on Redstone rockets. But uh, John Lynn, with his first orbital flight, was on Freedom 7, which was, again, an off-the-shelf Atlas ICBM with a human payload instead of the standard Avco Mark IV re-entry vehicle. And you get an idea in this picture just how large that re-entry vehicle was. Now, the RV is the external structure that allows the W-38 nuclear weapon to survive re-entry. Re so the RV was a big deal and uh, it protected the weapon and uh, allowed it to re-enter safely without uh, burning up on re-entry. All of these were under the control of the Strategic Air Command. And I want to really notice the motto of SAC, peace is our profession. And for years, people were screaming BS about that because you know, how can the world's most powerful military organization be professing peace as their profession. Well, what is the number one mission of the Strategic Air Command? Deterrence. It's deterrence. And it worked. And it guaranteed peace because as long as SAC was ready to respond to any threat, anytime, anywhere in the world, we had a guarantee of uh, you know, a stalemate, um, a peaceful environment. And so that got us through the Cold War. Oh, back up here. This is Vandenberg Air Force Base, and this was the very first deployed Atlas ICBM on its uh, launch platform. Uh, this picture is made from the railroad tracks with our back to the sea. It gives you an orientation. So uh, this is right on the, the coast. Uh, Southern California, and uh, that's Atlas site number one. So with the introduction of our ICBMs, we had our man bombers, the ICBMs, and then also the Navy's Polaris submarines, the nuclear submarines, which are intermediate range ballistic missiles. And those three together form what's referred to as the strategic triad. And that continues today to be the model for America's deterrence forces. And uh, it's very, very effective. Now, a little segue here. Um, you know, you've heard me use this term deterrence multiple times. And we have to keep in mind that deterrence only works when our enemy loves its children and its society more than it hates you. I'll repeat that. Deterrence only works when your enemy loves or respects its children and its heritage more than it hates you. If you're facing an enemy with no regard to any of those, then there's no way you can deter that enemy from attacking you or trying to destroy you. And uh, that's what our young people have to understand. The world does not, everyone in the world doesn't think like we do. And we have to understand certain enemies cannot be negotiated with or treated in a way that we would expect to be treated. And uh, that's an important lesson. Here's the uh, Mark IV reentry vehicle being mounted to the Atlas inside the silo. And, uh, will recognize the connecting point on this gaseous oxygen vent tube when we actually go into the silo and call attention to that. Uh, the W-38 was approximately 
five times more powerful than the Hiroshima weapon. And uh, incredibly more accurate. And we had hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, we really did, during the Cuban Missile Crisis especially, uh, outnumbered the Soviets uh, way above a 10 to 1 ratio in terms of nuclear power. Okay, here's your typical Atlas site layout. Uh, this site is in Salina, Kansas. The closet hangers could go anywhere, but the four acre square here you see is exactly the same on every site. And here's our site tube. So that automatically tells you the orientation is to the north. And we have our entry portal, emergency escape hatch, and um, our missile is locked and loaded, ready to fly. This is what is called a PLX, a propellant loading exercise. And it's very dangerous because you're putting this liquid oxygen in the missile. And they lost three sites to catastrophic explosions during propellant loading exercises. So that accelerated the retirement of the Atlas from uh, the Air Force inventory. Uh, can't afford to lose sites like that. These are the uh, six bases that hosted the Atlas mission. There's, there's Walker at Roswell. And, uh, of those six bases, only Altus and Dias are the only two that are still open. These are the 12 sites around Dias. They're numbered just like the hours of the clock. So Albany site is number two. Here we are at number six. The uh, Bradshaw site no longer exists, and all the rest of these sites are in private ownership. Now we also had the Nike missile at Abilene during that time. We had two batteries, one on the north side of town and one on the southwest side of town. And each of those batteries had a total of eight Nikes. And these were nuclear-tipped, nuclear-armed anti-aircraft missiles. And um, it's interesting that, you know, the Air Force, if you ask them about nukes, the traditional response would be, what? You neither confirm nor deny. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Word for word. That is absolutely gospel. In the Air Force, when they're talking about nuclear weapons, you can neither confirm nor deny. You know, and uh, the Army didn't have that same philosophy. And this, this is an article from an Abilene publication. And the commander in the article is actually talking about, well, the the Nike can be either conventionally armed or nuclear armed, but all of ours are nuclear. <laughs> and I just, I kind of hee-haw about that because there was just no reservation on the Army's part about bragging about the nukes that they had. And uh, I don't I won't elaborate on the comparison between the Air Force and Army any more than that. <laughs> This is kind of like, this is where we're seated right now. And uh, we'll go down to the launch control area. 40 foot tunnel connects us to the 18 and a half foot silo. Uh, this illustration doesn't show the propellant tanks, the liquid oxygen tanks and the diesel tanks that were, that occupied almost the entire lower two stories of the silo. But each one of these levels were just packed with essential equipment, hydraulics, uh, uh, all, the, all the infrastructure necessary to maintain and operate and launch the, uh, the Atlas. So that was probably the one major design flaw of this entire site, was the co-location of the missile with all of its oxidizers and propellants, which means you had a unquenchable bomb. Um, once this stuff started, it didn't need air to burn. I mean, it had everything it needed. And one of the Roswell explosions, 
literally blew the silo out of the ground. And uh, that's, that's a big explosion. Now, in spite of that, there's never been a fatality among a crew member as a result of those catastrophic explosions. I imagine there was some soiled underwear, but uh, there's never been a fatality as a result of any of those explosions, which, you know, adds to the, the confidence and the integrity of the launch control center. This is uh, this site after groundbreaking and construction commenced. It started with a 45-foot trench, and then they started digging the silo down from that level using a single bulldozer. This is called mucking, back and forth, putting dirt in the bucket, which would be brought to the surface dumped into an awaiting dump truck, he would go out. This is, by the way, this is the lawn site. We're looking north in this photograph. And the, immediately another dump truck would be there awaiting its next load. And that continued 24-7 until they got down to 185 feet. And you see the building we're sitting in right now from the ground up. Looking down into the silo. When they started pouring concrete, that was poured continuously until the entire silo was completed. And then they came in with the rebar. And this is pretty amazing to me. Uh, all these sections of rebar are numbered and preformed. And we're talking, amazingly, about three inch rebar. No one uses three inch rebar for anything today unless you're building a nuclear reactor. And there's nine feet continuously of this three inch rebar with a tack weld on every intersection. I'd love to know how many millions of tack welds that is. I'm sure someone could be crazy enough to try to figure that out. <laughs> anyway, but you see the guy standing on it, it gives you an idea of scale, just how huge that steel rebar is. And it was so close together that when they poured the concrete, they had to use vibrators to move it through. There was just enough room for the concrete to go through the nine foot thick wall. And that's why to call this a steel reinforced structure is a, is a misnomer. It's a steel structure that's just encapsulated with concrete. And the concrete they used was a ballistic type of concrete that uh, was uh, Portland cement mixed with a acrylic resin. So all the concrete here has a plastic, plasticized characteristic. It can actually flex with shock. And that's why we say that these sites were only vulnerable to direct thermonuclear strikes. And you see the entry stairwells being poured there. Popping out of the ground right there is the site tube. You realize there's some idiot in a pickup truck backed into that? <laughs> it would throw this entire thing off. <laughs> And uh, it's amazing that something like that never happened. That, uh, anyway. Now, Brown and Root was responsible for all the steel work, and they hung the steel. The Zachary uh, Concrete was responsible for the dirt work and the concrete. And uh, a lot of steel. After the steel work and all the interior structural work was completed, they brought in the water bird. It was a Atlas model that they would fill with water, and that's how they would adjust the counterbalances on the elevator. So when the Atlas arrived, it would be absolutely perfect, ready to go, and now and, uh, they, they go to action immediately. So here's a nested bird, and that's the Atlas in the launch position. This is an Atlas arriving. And uh, there's a single hookup point where they lift the missile. And you look at it and say, 
that, there's no way that could have worked. We have to keep in mind that the entire stainless steel balloon is filled with nitrogen gas at this time. So the only thing they have to do is connect the missile erector to the engine compartment, raise the missile, nest it, and it's taken below for storage. When it's fully refueled, you see how it cakes up with ice because that thin skin and the liquid oxygen is so cold it just cakes up like that. So uh, here's our launch control center. Oh, back up here. This entire launch control center was suspended from the ceiling. You see the chain links there. And uh, before I modified the benches and everything. Um, and this is at a New York, um, Plattsburgh, New York facility. That's the air shocks that suspended the entire two-story building. And uh, there were four of those air shocks, all synchronized in a way to maintain a perfectly level floor. This is where we're seated right now. And there's the massive air compression system for the shock absorbers I just showed you. There's the ladder for the emergency escape hatch. And um, there are four tons of sand in that tube. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Downstairs, the launch control center, the commander's position with the launch controller, the uh, Lock box with the orders in it, the power generation station, communications equipment, and the commander's office, and uh, television monitors. And that's where all the action took place. So you had a crew of five doing the same job that over 110 men did to launch the same missile at Cape Canaveral. So that's a lot of responsibility for two officers and three. Airmen, quite a bit of responsibility. Typical crew, and uh, you notice they're very, very unique uniforms. The commander always wore a sidearm, uh, but the, the crew wore their, they call them painter suits. And uh, it's a brilliant white uniform. And the whole idea for that uniform is if you ever got anything on that uniform, anyone can see that. And the problem is you're dealing with an oxygen environment. So if you get a hydrocarbon of any kind on your uniform and you go into an oxygen-rich environment, you become catastrophically explosive. So if you change a tire or you're sloppy with a peanut butter sandwich and you have anything on that uniform, and you don't notice it, someone else will. And uh, Sanders, get out of that before you kill us, you know. <laughs> so whatever, you'll get out of that uniform and uh, make sure you're not uh, bringing a hydrocarbon into a oxygen-rich environment. Now, also, if you were on an Atlas team, you were not responsible for the laundering of your uniform. They had uh, special care for those uniforms to guarantee that they were always pristine. And uh, when I say white, these weren't just white, they were angelic white. And uh, when you had your uniform, and these guys loved to brag about it, and they were on base, they didn't wait in any line for any reason. So you could go to the mess and get in line for lunch. If you're in your uniform, you're on your way to duty, and you didn't wait in line, you just stepped to the front of the line and no one said a word about it. Um, at the BX, uh, wherever you were, you had privileges, regardless of your rank, to go to the front of any line. And uh, those guys love bragging about that. <coughs> Locked and loaded Atlas, ready to fly. Curtis LeMay and uh, Robert McNamara decided to pull the plug on the Atlas in uh, December of 1964 after several accidents. And that was after the Titan II and the Minuteman I 
were fully deployed and ready to take over the ICBM mission. And all the atlases had been pulled from their launch locations by April of 65 and taken to Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, California and stored there temporarily until they were either retrofitted for satellite deployment or destroyed. And uh, hundreds of them were destroyed, which is just really stupid. But uh, I guess Lockheed wanted to have an opportunity to build some new ones. Uh, the Titan II replaced uh, very, very capably the uh, Atlas ICBM and um, lived a lot longer than it was supposed to. These were active until 1985. And then today it's totally the Minuteman. And the Sentinel, which is going to be the Minuteman replacement, is being discussed, but that's probably years away and uh, billions of dollars as well. So this is a Minuteman launch facility. It only takes a crew of two to launch up to 100 Minutemen, whereas it took a crew of five to launch one Atlas. So a lot of progress, um, a lot more pressure on a smaller number of uh, professionals, but um, that's the system. This is when I had my orientation at Minot, North Dakota, to the Minuteman site there. So that was pretty cool. And we continue to use Atlases, though, for peacetime missions and modified for satellite deployment. And that's the lineage going from the first generation Atlas all the way to the Atlas V, which we continue to launch today. That has a very limited life. We'll be, probably continue using Atlases for maybe two, three, four more years. And then those will be replaced by the new generation of uh, a privately manufactured satellite deployment uh, launch vehicles. Now, the early Atlas V was a kind of a, a sore point to our Department of Defense because instead of using multiple Rocket 9 engines, they used two RD 180 engines, which were built in, of all places, where? China or Russia? Russia. Russia built those engines and they cost a fortune and the DOD was very upset to be paying that much money to the Russians for uh, launching our uh, launch vehicles. So uh, summer a year ago was the first year we finally had a replacement for the RD-180s and uh, I'm sorry and now uh, we're launching our Atlas Vs with US made <laughs> engines. So, you know, progress has been, has been made. What happened to our launch sites? Uh, this particular property was bought by the city of Lawn. They turned it into an emergency shelter and used it for that purpose for a short time before they deserted it and uh, just let it go to Mother Nature. Um, most of these sites nationwide have been uh, either destroyed or modified for private use. Um, I started on this project in 99, and that's what it looked like when I started here. Um, 90 or 99? No, I'm sorry, 99. And uh, that's the front door. So I was like the uh, crocodile hunter. The first time I came in here, I had to crawl on my belly through that little opening into what I thought was a rattlesnake pit. <laughs> and um, it was very intimidating. And the site was a mess, but uh, you know, the city made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So, uh, it was a much younger Larry. So uh, this is the only Atlas site dedicated to historic preservation and public interpretation. And we want to continue that. Now, I wanted to show you this picture because this is the picture you saw earlier, which was the first site for an Atlas deployment yeah. at the Vandenberg Air Force Base. You see the Pacific in the background there. So this is the back side of that first location with the Atlas on it. And that's the condition. This is the way this site looks today. 
And that's our first ICBM facility in America. And there's been no effort to preserve it in any context. And uh, right there on the Pacific, it's just going to melt away. And uh, all I have to do is look at this picture on a regular basis, and that's motivation for me to, Larry, get your bedding gear. you got to get going because you don't want the site you're working on to turn into this. And, uh, it's so easy to let that happen. So now Texas is the only site that's a uh, state that's recognized that it's, it's Atlas Heritage. Uh, we dedicated the ICBM Highway in 2001. As I mentioned earlier, this was our new Governor Bush's first bill to sign into law. And it was Governor Bush. So, any questions before we go downstairs? Stood at his power console here 
in that mode, anticipating the next message from SAC to launch. DEFCON 1 would be the order to launch. And uh, so they were ready to launch for just over nine hours. Oh, yes, obviously. Uh, oh, yeah, one thing real quick. What makes this area so historically significant is this structure right here. And uh, we're totally encapsulated by this steel walled structure. And when this was operational, there's actually a, uh, another curtain that completed that envelope of steel. And this, in, in essence, comprises what's referred to as a Faraday box. EMP. And it protects all the electronics here, navigation equipment, communications equipment, etc., from the electromagnetic pulse. And it's also historically significant because there are a lot of historians and authors who accuse SAC of not implementing the use of a deterrent weapon in the Atlas ICBM, but instead of creating a very accurate first strike weapon. So why would you need an incredibly you, you, you accurate wouldn't. weapon like this if it's just a retaliation tool? Mm. And uh, the answer to that is, well, this proves that peace is our profession. You wouldn't need protection from EMP if, if you were this the first was a strike. first strike weapon. Correct. Because the weapon would be gone. Wow. This was dry yesterday. <laughs> yeah, it must have really dumped. Oh, it just it just dumped night. on this last night. Man, we just got sprinkled them. <laughs> wow. And of course, all of this is just sweat from uh, high humidity and cold temperatures of steel. So, okay, so we're exactly 45 feet underground now. If you just stay to your left, you can stay out of the water. Oh, that's your head there. Step up and step down. Gotcha. Straight ahead. Gotcha. Up and down and straight ahead. Another step right here. Whoa, is that water high? Holy cow. Gee, many Christmas. Look at, there's just where we were standing. That water is, that's like 165 feet deep. When we saw his video, remember that boat yes. was way down there. Wow. It is high. Yep. <laughs> Let me, I'm trying to get out of your way. I've seen it before. Okay. <laughs> so I'm guessing it's about 165? Uh, maybe 140, 145. But uh, you can see just how amazingly clear the water is. And that's the, the gaseous oxygen tube that ex would extend out to the nose of the missile. You remember that picture yep, I was yep. talking to, about? And uh, so that gives you an idea that we'd almost be at eye level to the, the reentry vehicle. Okay. And, um, and I lost one of my floats from, I built that on the water. And of course, when I built that, it was 64, 65 feet lower than it is today. Yeah, when we watched your video, it was way down there. Oh yeah, see, this was installed about 12, 13 years ago. And you raise the hatch, go down 10 feet in an OSHA standard offset, down 30 feet, to another platform, OSHA standard offset, and then 30 more feet to the bottom of that ladder structure and then step onto the platform. And uh, so that's how much the water has come up. And, you know, none of that is surface water. It's all, and I, I'm sure there's a hydrostatic pressure. So what did they do when it was operational? Well, they had a sump pump running 24 7 right. all the time. And that was all taken out. Well, yeah, that was salvaged. And, uh, and it, it's interesting because when they removed the sump pumps, they came, that was on a Friday, and they came back 
to reinitiate their work on Monday, and there was already 25 feet of water. Oh, so they couldn't, they literally couldn't access anything else, and they just left the, the last level and, uh, you know, slammed the doors. So is the yes, the light pipes are on. Yeah, the entire AT and half story structure was supported by these four hard points on six stories of massive coil springs that would allow the entire structure to bounce up and down about a foot and a half. So totally insulated from shock. You watch your step. By the way, if anyone has a good source for it. Steel plates. <laughs> I can use a bunch of them. Now, this is the debris door. And this was an engineering afterthought. So after all the construction was finished, the engineers started thinking about, hey, wait a minute. If there's an explosion here, in the silo. These doors will be shot down this tunnel to the crew, just like bullets through a rifle. So the engineers came up with this idea, and that's why it's so different from everything else, because this is all, this is inch and a half plate steel. Insanely heavy. Yeah. And this was after construction, so that you couldn't have a crane, you, know, you had a winch at the top of the stairwell lowering right. this stuff. But once it got down here, you've got to position these things and then these massive wells. And I would love to talk to anyone who was a part of this construction because uh, that would have been super challenging. <laughs> Interesting. Sheesh. Look that out. Ooh, look at that heat coming in. So you're down in humidity and now I see a blister out here. Ooh. So that was the Atlas F missile silo outside of Lawn, Texas. And this is a Lawn Atlas missile base. Hope you liked that adventure. And until our next one, say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. Give the and that's all, folks.